Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, if this is your first experience, we're just a simple verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. Uh, I'm not a pastor. Please don't write and say reverend so-and-so. I'm just a layman. I always say I'm just a glorified Sunday school teacher, if anything. But uh, we're, uh, we're just lay people, and uh, we're cattle ranchers, as you'll see me refer to them from time to time. But uh, the Lord has given us this ministry, and uh, we just praise him for it. All right, for those of you in the studio, you're already where we left off in our last program. For those of you out in television, we're going to continue on in Psalm 68 and uh, finish our book number 79, which is all in Psalms, isn't it, honey, if I remember right? And uh, then we'll move on possibly to uh, the book of Daniel in our next stand, uh, taping. But for today, Psalm 68, and we're going to continue on now from where we left off. But I'm going to back up a verse or two because we kind of ran out of time. 68, verse 15. And remember, we're talking about the kingdom that's coming, over which Jesus, the Messiah, will yet one day rule and reign. And hills and so forth and mountains in the Old Testament usually refer to earthly kingdoms, see? And so the hill of God, in other words, this kingdom that's coming, is as the hill of Bashan. Now, I have to stop and explain that a little bit. Bashan is that mountainous area just east of Galilee and the Jordan River, through which the river Jabbok flowed, if you remember the story of Jacob. And it is quite, uh, quite mountainous. And uh, some of those are not like the Tetons in Wyoming, of course, not like our Rocky Mountains, but nevertheless, for the Middle East, they're pretty good-sized mountains. All right, and so the analogy here is that this kingdom that's coming will be as much higher than the normal kingdoms of the world as the mountains of Bashan are above the other hills and mountains of the Middle East. In other words, it's just going to be so glorious and so complete in its control of the planet. All right, now then, verse 16, Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. In other words, this kingdom is going to go right on into eternity. All right, now let's just drop down to verse 18. Now this is where we get the connection that this is a messianic psalm in that it is tied also to a New Testament reference, in this case from the Apostle Paul. And that is in verse 18, Thou, speaking of the king, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. All right, now let's just go chase that down in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is exactly what Paul is quoting from. Now for the skeptics and the scornful, they probably say, well, he just went back and found that. No, that's not the way the scriptures came together. The scriptures came together as the Holy Spirit inspired these writers to write. <clears throat> they did not go back and try to find another scripture that would fit where they're writing. And so this is just one of the <clears throat> supernatural aspects of our Bible, that even the Apostle Paul now, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit refers to this verse in the book of Psalms. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, dropping in at verse 8. Ephesians 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, in other words, from his post-resurrection and his 40 days with the eleven, from the book of Acts, we got the account of how he ascended back up into glory. <clears throat> All right, now when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. See, now this wasn't in the book of Psalms, so here we have an extension of what the Psalms does not tell us. He not only ascended, but he first descended. And I think we better take the time to explain what Paul is talking about. All right, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first 
into the lower parts of the earth, and he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill or fulfill all things. All right, now the only way I can explain that is by the use of the scripture itself. Come back with me, if you will, to Matthew <clears throat> chapter 12. Verse 38. Now what we're talking about is where did he descend to? What did he take from where he descended? All right, and we're going to chase this down from Scripture. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Well, now you remember the Scripture tells us the Jews always required a sign. So this is the typical Jewishness of these people. Show us a sign. Verse 39, but he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Four. Now remember, this is Jesus himself speaking, so what does this tell us? Jonah is not just a legend. Jonah is not a myth. Jesus puts his stamp of approval on it as the creator of everything. And he says, for Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now that's not a play on words. He's speaking of the place to which he will descend and take those who are in captivity there out and ascend up into the glory with them. Now, the only way we explain this lower regions of the earth is, again, let the Scripture do it, and that would be in Luke chapter 16, where we have the account of the rich man and Lazarus. And most of you here know it, but remember, we got a lot of people listening out there who have never heard these things before. That's the kind of mail we get. I'm hearing things I've never heard before. Had a letter yesterday been in church all my life. Caught your program three months ago. I've learned more in three months than I did in the previous 60 years. Well, they don't hear it. And so that's why I have to use the scriptures. Luke 16. And we can't take it all verse by verse or it'd take all afternoon, but we'll just hit the highlights that here we have Jesus again speaking. And if he isn't an authority, I don't know who is. And he says there was a certain rich man. Now this is not a parable. It doesn't call it a parable. It's, it's, I think, a reference to a real scenario. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. On the other side of the coin, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores. He was poor, destitute, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and looked his sword. In other words, he was a sad, sad piece of humanity. Now, verse 22, came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. In other words, into the paradise <coughs> side of this place of the departed. All right, <coughs> verse 23. Now, this is unfortunate in our King James anyway, and in hell. Now, the first thing people think of when they hear hell <laughs> is fire and brimstone. But you've got to understand that in the three words, let me put them on the board. That's the best way to get them cleared up. <clears throat> we have three words that all mean the same thing. Hell in the English, Sheol in the Hebrew, and Hades is the word in the Greek. Now this is unfortunate because hell is also described later as the lake of fire. But in this instance, we're not talking about the lake of fire. We're talking about the place of the dead, the departed, saved believers, as well as the lost. All right, so <clears throat> when it says in hell, he lifted up his eyes, we're talking about the Hebrew Sheol or the Greek Hades. All right. So in Hades, in this departed place of the dead, which included both paradise and torment, 
Got that? It's divided, and we're going to see that in just a minute. So he lifted up his eye, being in torment, and he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. In other words, Abraham and Lazarus are over there in paradise, the rich man's in torment. Verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives the good things, likewise Lazarus, evil, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. The two totally different scenarios. Now here comes the clue. Verse 26. <clears throat> Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would come pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, and so on and so forth. All right, so what we have here is this place of the departed, this in the lower regions of the earth, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. On the one hand is paradise, Abraham. On the other side is torment. Now, in order to understand this concept of why did the Old Testament believers have to go down into this place of the departed instead of up to heaven is a theological one. Hebrews tells us that the blood of animals and goats and bulls could not atone for men's sin. All they could do was cover them. So, since these Old Testament saints did not have their sins totally atoned for, they could not go into the glory. They had to go down to paradise and wait for the true atoning blood, which was Jesus Christ. All right, so when Christ shed his blood on the cross then, <clears throat> that was now sufficient for the whole human race, provided they appropriated it by faith. All right, so now then, after his death, and during the time of his three days in the tomb, his spirit went down into this place of the dead, not to the torment side, but to the believer's side. And what could he tell them? The atoning blood has now been shed. I can now take you with me up into the glory, whereas the lost are still going to the same place. That hasn't changed, see? All right, now then, with that in mind, we have to come back again to how Paul puts it, because like I said, he carries it a little more in detail than the psalmist does, but it's still the same concept, that the Old Testament believers went down into paradise waiting for the shedding of the true blood of atonement, whereupon then Christ could take them out, and up to glory. All right, come back to Ephesians once again. Hopefully now it'll make more sense, especially if you've never heard these things before. So after his death on the cross, while his body is up in the tomb, his spirit goes down into Hades, or Sheol, and he announces to those believers from the Old Testament that he had now accomplished that which they were waiting for. All right, back to Ephesians 4, <clears throat> verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity of captive. In other words, those souls and spirits of believers confined down there in paradise in the center of the earth because they couldn't go into the glory of heaven until their sins had been atoned for. All right, then it says, verse 8, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, which, of course, was poured out at Pentecost. Then verse 9, now that he ascended up to glory, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth, exactly as Jesus spoke of it concerning Jonah. That as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three nights and three days, or three days and three nights, in the heart of the earth. See? Same identical language. Now, I imagine everybody has the same problem I do. <laughs> 
And for me, it's not a problem because I certainly believe the scriptures. But if we understand the makeup of planet Earth, what have we been taught is at the center? The core of molten, molten material. That's, that's, that's our concept of the center of the Earth. But you see, we have to overcome that and realize that God is still able to, in spite of all that, there had to be a place that he was able to describe, as we've seen here, where the departed believers were on one side and the departed unbelievers were on the other. And of course, they're still there. The unbelievers will be there until the resurrection of John chapter 5. All right. <clears throat> and then verse 10. So he that descended, the same Jesus Christ, is the same Jesus Christ who ascended up far above all heavens. Well, now, the psalmist used it as above all the highest hills. See, he is above and beyond everything that man can think of. And then, of course, Paul goes on how that he gave gifts to men which were apostles, prophets, evangelists, and so on and so forth. All right, now then. Let's go back and pick up our account in Psalm 68. <clears throat> now verse 19. Blessed be the Lord. See all these references to deity as we come through this chapter? It's just over and over and over. It's either God or Lord or Jehovah or whatever. All right, verse 19 again. Be blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits even the God of our salvation. Now, you remember, I'm always stressing, what is the main theme of Scripture? Salvation. The whole book is constantly trying to bring lost people to a knowledge of salvation. You remember the very verse we started with this afternoon in Peter? Of which salvation the prophets searched? Well, it's the theme of Scripture, is to bring lost people to a place of God's salvation, see? All right, so he is our God, the God of salvation. Verse 20 now, and unto the God, the Lord belongs the issues from death. But now we step in again to the wrath of God that's going to precede this glorious kingdom. Now he comes back to the tribulation experience, but God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such a one as goeth on still in his trespasses, speaking of lost humanity. And again, verse 22, the Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. In other words, he's still going to bring his people Israel from wherever they are on the planet to be ready to come into this glorious kingdom that is being promised. All right, now verse 23, yet another picture of his wrath and the horrors of the tribulation. <clears throat> that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thy enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs will lick the same. And now let's go back and compare Revelation. Revelation, I think it's 19. And we have the same scenario, the horrors of these final days of the wrath and vexation that's coming on the planet. Now, you know, I, I know that I have people listening to me, not in here, but out on TV land that just ridicule this. They just can't imagine that the so-called God of the Bible is going to bring on such mass death and destruction. Yes, he is. And I've been giving the reason in all the programs lately. Why? Because during these last 6,000 years of human history, God has been merciful and gracious and offering salvation at every turn. And when the man of humanity rejected, then yes, his wrath is going to finally fall. Hasn't happened yet but it will. All right, Revelation 19, and how that compares with uh, Psalm 68, 23. Thy foot may be dipped in the blood of your enemy, see? And the dogs will lap up the blood of the slain of humanity. Now look how Revelation puts it. Chapter 19, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, 
And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Now I've got to stop again. <laughs> Can't help it. People get all hung up on, on simple terms of Scripture. And they say, well, lest you speak of three heavens, what are they? Well, here's the one example. What is the heaven in which the birds fly, for heaven's sakes? Oh, our atmosphere, the air around us. Get a bird in here and he can fly. <laughs> What's the second heaven? Oh, outer space. See, the space program is penetrating deeper and deeper into space. And then Paul speaks of the third heaven. And what was that? The very heaven of the heavens, the presence of God. Those are your three heavens of Scripture, see? All right, that's why I had to think of it. The birds of the heaven. That just simply means the birds of our atmosphere. All right? And the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. What is it? To clean up the death of the human race that's laying on the surface of the earth, see? All right, gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses and them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. See, that's going to be the end result of this final seven years. Now I got time. A verse comes to mind. I don't think you'll find it in any of your margins in your Bible. But uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I think it's 25. I see some of these verses I don't even think of while I'm preparing. And uh, it's a good thing the Lord brings them to mind while I'm at it. But here it is. Jeremiah, chapter 25, we've used them before. And the Bible is full of these kinds of descriptions for those final seven years, and especially the closing months and days. And I think it's going to be nuclear war. You've heard of the uh, nuclear winter, where everything is just barren? Well, I think it's coming. In fact, they've been advertising, you know, the only TV I watch is pro football. Forgive me, those people that think it's violent, but I love my cowboys. But what's, what have they been advertising lately? A movie coming sometime yet in the month of December, the last days of some sort. And as I looked at that preview, I just said, Lord, you're getting them ready. You're getting them ready. They're going to see all that stuff that Hollywood dreams up. It's going to become a reality. It's going to be beyond human description. Now look at it. This is what the scripture says. This is what Les Feldick thinks. This is what the book says. Jeremiah 25. I've got time. Go all the way back to verse 30. Jeremiah 25. And I know some of you see me use these more than once. But again, there's people out there that have never heard this before. Jeremiah 25 verse 30, Therefore prophesy or speak forth thou against them all these words and say unto them the Lord. Now that's God the Son in the Old Testament, our Jesus Christ of the New. The Lord shall roar from on high, utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth, not just Israel, this is going to be for the whole world's population, all seven billion of them. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. Why? Because of their rejection of everything that he's ever said or done. Their hatefulness toward him. Their rebellion, their corruption, as we're seeing every time we turn around lately, the corruption. And don't think it's confined to America. My, you get into these banana republics and corruption is what everybody thrives on, see? Well, God is putting all that on their account, see? All right. And so he has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, that is, to death. Now here's where it's going to come. Compare this with Psalms and compare Revelation, and it all fits. Verse 32, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, 
a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the borders of the earth. That's, to me, nuclear power being exercised. Now here it is. A slain of the Lord shall be at that time from one end of the earth even to the other. My, we thought the tsunami a few years ago was horrible, but that was just a little, just a little speck of planet earth. This is from pole to pole and from east to west, see? All right, from one end of the earth to the other, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. How did Revelation picture it? As food for the birds of prey? Well, birds of prey don't go six feet deep to find a corpse, do they? It's laying on the ground. And so this is what's coming. It's going to be total death and destruction. Well, let me have one more minute, too. Let's go back to Psalm 68, and, and, uh, and maybe we can move on from there in our next program. Now we come back again to the joy of the kingdom, the glory that's going to follow the horrors of the tribulation. Verse 24, back in Psalm 68. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my king. See? The king in the sanctuary. That's the nation of Israel. The singers. In other words, all the celebration of this coming king and his kingdom. The singers went before. The players on instruments followed after and among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. Can't you picture it? Bless you, God, in the congregation, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin down on the south part of Israel's geography with their ruler, the princes of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun, who is a little further north, and then the princes of Naphtali. He's on the north. So what do we got? We've got a picture of Israel from south to north. The whole 12 tribes are all going to enjoy this glorious heaven on earth kingdom ruled by their Messiah. All right, now I'll take one more verse, and I guess it'll be time to wind her down. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us because of thy temple at Jerusalem. See that? The temple at Jerusalem will cause people to bring gifts to the king. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.